Hello, I'm Professor Scott Applegate, and I would like to welcome you to PSCS 6248, Introduction to Cyber Conflict. During this presentation, I will briefly explain the standards of this course to ensure you understand my expectations of you over the next eight weeks. Agenda. During this presentation, we will briefly cover the class policies and syllabus and discuss some goals and expectations beyond the textbook materials. Class policies and syllabus. As you begin each unit of the course, please ensure you complete the assigned readings prior to attempting assignments. Review the slides. They often contain additional content not included in the readings. For example, Jay Healy's book on the history of cyber con conflict was published in 2013. I have included events on the slides that have taken place since the, that book was published. This is a non-attribution environment. Please do not cite or quote myself or any of your fellow classmates without their express permission outside of this class. Do not post classified information to the course website. Many of the students and myself have security clearances. We are not authorized to view classified materials that we have not been cleared for, regardless of whether they have been leaked out onto the internet. Please respect that. Make sure you engage with your fellow classmates. The students in this course often have a wealth of knowledge and experience. You will gain more from your fellow students than you will from me or the, the slides. Keep that in mind. Debate ideas, but stay civil and professional. It is okay to aggressively attack an idea you, you disagree with. It is not okay to aggressively attack your fellow classmates. Understand the difference. Support your opinions with evidence. This course is graded at the graduate level. In your discussions and presentations, make sure you are supporting your positions and opinions with strong, credible evidence. While I value each of your opinions, at the graduate level, I expect you to demonstrate through research and citation that those opinions are educated. I don't expect you to be an expert on the subject matter of this course, but I do expect you to discuss it at an expert level based on your readings and research. And finally, avoid membership in what I call the Mutual Admiration Society. In many discussion forums, one student will reply to another simply by saying, Hey, what a great post! Your idea about X, Y, and Z was truly awesome! While that's a nice thing to say, it does not advance the conversation. When you are replying to students in the discussions, I want you to advance the conversation. That means take a deeper look at something that they've talked about, take a contrary position, or find a tangent that is related to what they were discussing and take us in a new direction. At the end of the day, we're trying to broaden our knowledge and simply congratulating each other on posts does not do that. Make sure before you continue in this course, you take the time to review the syllabus on the course website. Review the grading rubrics. Make sure you understand the grading criteria for each assignment and the standards for this course. For every assignment in this course, there is a grading rubric. Do not assume the standards for this course are the same as those used in your previous courses in this program. Each professor is allowed to set standards for his or her courses as he or she sees fit. My standards are considered among the most rigorous in the program, so keep that in mind. Forewarned is forearmed. Turn in assignments on time and ensure they are complete. If you have an emergency, please try to let me know as soon as possible so that we can work together to resolve the situation. Pre-planned work and personal trips are not emergencies. If you know you will be out of town, you need to make arrangements with me well in advance to either complete the assignment early or schedule a makeup assignment. Goals beyond the textbook materials. In this course, I expect you to demonstrate critical thinking, research, analysis, and graduate level writing and presentation skills. You are not here to regurgitate facts. You are here to learn, analyze, evaluate, reason, and draw conclusions. Most of the assignments in this course will reflect that philosophy. You do not need a master's degree to regurgitate facts. You need a master's degree to conduct research, make educated decisions, manage complex problems, and lead others in doing the same. As a hiring manager in the Army, I've interviewed hundreds of applicants and hired dozens of employees, most of whom had master's degrees. 
When I hire someone of this caliber, my expectations are that they will be able to perform at this level, at the level I will be pushing you towards in this course. In my current position on the Joint Staff, I write papers on a regular basis for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and I review projects from the White House. On a daily basis, I use the skills discussed in this presentation. I encourage you to incorporate these skills into your personal toolkit as they are invaluable in cutting through the hype often associated in this field. Evidence-Based Reasoning I currently hold two master's degrees and am most of the way through a PhD with just my dissertation left to complete that degree. In the very last course I took in my PhD program, my professor explained to me the concept of evidence-based reasoning and what the characteristics of good evidence are. I wish someone had imparted this knowledge to me on my first graduate level course. The next few slides are my attempt to pass this knowledge on to you and it is really key to understanding how to frame problems at the graduate level. All research in science, technology, and engineering is inferential in nature. In these areas, we draw probabilistic conclusions about things that matter to us on the basis of evidence that we gather by experimentation or other means. What does this mean? This means the problems we're tackling at the graduate level are not black and white problems. They don't have yes and no answers. They have different answers, many times based on context or how it, that problem relates to your organization. And so oftentimes what you are trying to do is find the best solution for your organization under a particular set of circumstances. And you do this by gathering data or doing research. There are three basic ingredients to evidence-based reasoning, the hypothesis, evidence, and arguments linking the hypothesis to the evidence. The hypothesis is a position that you're trying to defend, the question you're trying to answer, or the stance you've taken. Evidence is data that supports your position. And with that data, you need to make arguments linking that evidence to your position, to your hypothesis. You can't always assume that someone else will interpret the data the same way you do. Research and source evaluation. Let's start by discussing the characteristics of evidence. There are four characteristics of evidence. Accuracy, is the evidence actually correct in what it's stating? Relevance, is the evidence actually related to the problem you're trying to solve or the stance you're taking? Credibility, does the evidence come from a, a reliable source? An inferential force, how strong is the evidence? These are the four characteristics you should evaluate each piece of evidence that you use to support your arguments or your hypothesis. Empirical versus anecdotal evidence. Empirical evidence is generally supported by facts, numbers, by data that shows it is strong and credible and that it is correct. Anecdotal evidence, on the other hand, is generally a single example that may or may not be indicative of what you're trying to prove. You may have found the one time in 99 times that a certain event happened in a certain way. That doesn't prove it's going to happen that way 99 other times. In this field, sometimes we have to rely on anecdotal evidence because unfortunately there's not a great deal of, evidence, of empirical evidence gathered on some of the things we're trying to prove. But when you have the opportunity, you should always rely on empirical versus anecdotal evidence. Scholarly versus non-scholarly. Many students in the program have a tendency to rely on Google and popular media sources to support their positions. Unfortunately, that is simply not strong enough. And as we've seen time and again, the popular media and the news sources out there often post incorrect information. Many times they'll go back and correct that information later, but that's not good enough for our purposes. We want to rely on what are called scholarly sources, generally meaning they're peer-reviewed. And we'll discuss that here in a few minutes. Um, there are times to use non-scholarly sources, though, and so it's important that you understand how to use evidence. When you are trying to defend a position, you want to rely on scholarly empirical evidence whenever possible. 
you can use non-scholarly evidence such as news websites and things like that to paint background information for the topic you're studying. For instance, if you're trying to show that a particular event happened at a certain date and time, your popular media sources out there are probably fine for doing that. If you're trying to say that the Russians conducted a particular attack, your popular media sources aren't going to be strong enough to do that because they aren't experts on that and they generally speaking don't post the sources of their information so you can't evaluate that information and that's important. So what constitutes strong credible scholarly sources? Here you will see a list of various types of sources, websites, books, magazines, newspapers, journals, conferences, dissertations, and theses. Generally speaking, the farther you move down this list, the more scholarly in nature the sources are. And that is because towards the bottom of the list, these sources go undergo a process called peer review. In peer review, when an author submits a work for publication, the publisher will go out and find experts in the field to review that, that author's work. Those experts have no vested interest in seeing that article get published. Their interest is only in protecting the credibility of their field. And I will tell you from personal experience, peer reviews can be quite traumatic. Um, they do not pull punches, but they do that for a reason. They do that to make sure that when these things are published in journals, conferences, or as dissertations and theses, that they are accurate and to the best of their knowledge that they represent the truth. At the top of the list, what we generally see are editors that look at things that get published. And they are usually only interested in things such as grammar and clarity. They aren't subject matter experts on many of the articles that are being published in their organizations, and so they can't really vet the knowledge. At the end of the day, what you'll find is good sources show their work meaning they either show you the data that their, their positions are based on, or they show you the sources through citation and reference that they've used to present their information. The important part of that is that allows you personally to go back and review that data and see if you agree with it, or go back and look at those sources that they've cited and see if one, they're characterizing those sources correctly, and two, if you agree with those sources. So let's look at an example of how source credibility can, can help us. Let's say you're conducting research and you read about a new exploit in an article. How do you evaluate the credibility of that source? How do you tell if that exploit is real or if it's hype? Several years ago, while conducting research on kinetic cyber attacks, I came across an article in Fire Engineering Magazine that claimed you could start a fire by hacking an HP printer. Since I was very interested at the time in kinetic attacks, I thought this was great, and I immediately went to do more research to find out more information about this hack. I found lots of other sources reporting this story. SC Magazine, Tech News, Scientific America, Ars Technica, Naked Security, Fox News. I even found a class action lawsuit that had been filed based on these stories. Someone was going to sue HP over their flaming printer hack. Surely with all these sources reporting on it, it must be true. Except for the fact that it wasn't. How did I know it wasn't true? How did I get right what these credible media sources got wrong? And the answer is, I went to the primary source. In one of the articles, they listed the author of the research. The researcher's name was Ang Sui, and it was very easy to go out and find the paper, the peer-reviewed paper that he had published on this. Not only that, but there was actually a video of his presentation at a security conference on the same topic. And the interesting thing about this is what Ang Sui's presentation and research showed was the exact opposite of what all of these sites were reporting. 
he showed that it was physically impossible to start a fire by hacking an HP printer because the printer had a hardware installed fuse in it. Once the printer's temperature went over a certain temperature, that fuse popped and that printer became a paperweight and you could do nothing else to it. In the process of this, you could create a brown mark on a piece of paper as you got the temperature up a little higher, but once you, but far before you got to a point of combustion, that fuse would pop and this printer became a paperweight. And so all of these media sources were actually reporting completely wrong information. And they were all doing what we call circular reporting as well. They were all reporting on the original story that had come out by a researcher, or excuse me, by a reporter who had not understood the material he'd read in the research. That's why it's important for you to vet your sources. Style and format. We will use APA format for the research presentation and for citation on all online discussions in the forums. APA provides you a method for organizing your work in an acceptable and efficient manner for your reader. A safety net to ensure you are properly attributing and crediting your sources so that you are not committing plagiarism. And preparation for the rest of the classes you will take throughout your academic career. Once you know and use one style and format, it's very easy to shift to others if other classes use different formats, such as Chicago. You can find an 80% solution on the Purdue Online Writing Lab website. Lots of examples, probably the one you need. Or you can invest in your own copy of the APA Style Manual. I strongly suggest you purchase a copy of your own. The APA Style Manual is a invaluable resource and does teach you a lot more beyond simply citation and references. The mechanics of writing. Know and write your thesis statement. When I read a discussion, somewhere in the first paragraph, I expect to see a sentence that tells me what that discussion is going to be about. When I read a long research paper, somewhere in the first couple paragraphs, I expect to find a sentence or two that tells me what the author is trying to prove, what they're trying to make. This is their thesis. Structure your paper and create an outline. Papers and paragraphs, for that matter, have similar structures. They start with an introduction. There is a body that lays out arguments, evidence, and analysis, and a conclusion or transition to the next idea. In the course of a paper, your introduction will usually lay out background on the subject you're tackling, and then in the body, each paragraph will tackle specific arguments. Usually, each paragraph will cover one theme or idea. At the end of each paragraph, what you'll typically find is really good writers will have a transition to the next idea in the next paragraph. Each paragraph should focus on one main theme or idea. And as you're writing, evaluate your writing to ensure that you're not including things that don't need to be there. If you write a paragraph and you find that paragraph has nothing to do with what you're trying to prove, it probably doesn't belong in the paper. Writing tips. Write multiple drafts. Do not turn in a first or a second draft of a paper or presentation. Believe me, I will know. Give yourself enough time when you're writing a paper or when you're building a presentation to set it aside for a few days and then come back and read it. And you will see it with fresh eyes and be able to find your own mistakes and find things that don't quite make sense. Ensure your reader knows what you're writing about. As said earlier, your thesis should be evident to your reader in the first couple paragraphs of a paper or in the first couple sentences of a paragraph. Have someone else proofread your paper. First and foremost, when you write something and you make a typo or a minor grammar mistake, your mind knows what you were trying to say and will skip over that mistake and ignore it. When someone else reads your paper, it will be very obvious to them and they will pick up minor errors that you just won't see. Second, 
if another person reads your paper and they don't understand a portion of that paper, that means you've not explained it clearly. We're not writing engineering specs in this course. We're writing about topics that should be able to be clearly explained to a layman. And so it is worth your while to take your slide presentation or take your papers that you write and provide them to someone who's not an expert in the field and have them read it and see if they understand it. Cite external works whether you quote or paraphrase them. This means anytime you use someone else's work in your paper, I expect to see an in-text citation, and at the end of your paper, I expect, expect to see a corresponding reference. There should be at least a one-to-one -one ratio of references to citations in your paper. You may cite a particular source more than once, in which case you might have two or three to one in terms of citation to reference. But if you have a reference, it should be cited somewhere in your paper, and if you have a citation, it should be on your reference list. Use full references. That means you need to include the journal name, the volume and issue number, the page number if available, the website that you got the resource from. If it is a website, website that is subject to change, such as popular news and media sites, you need to include a reference, a, a retrieval date. That date essentially says that you are referencing that website as it existed on that date. If it is a formally published work, uh, generally you'll find these in PDF format, then you don't need to include a retrieval date because they're not likely to change. Don't assume that your reader has access to the library database that you're going to. When you publish a link to a library database, it is based on your username and password. If a reader tries to put that into their computer, to find your source, they will get blocked by a username and password request that they can't answer. That's why you need to use full references. Use digital object identifiers or DOI references when they are available. These are special references usually used with formal publication that provide a permanent link to where this resource is housed on the internet. In this slide, you'll see one listed that is to one of my papers. Avoid ending a paragraph or an idea with a quote. Many times students will put at the end of a paragraph or at the end of their paper a quote that they think sums up the essence of their idea. The problem is they're assuming that someone else will read that quote and interpret it exactly the way they did. In often cases, based on culture, background, experience, that is simply not the case. Different people will interpret things different ways, which means when you include a quote, you should take the time to provide some analysis linking that quote or that evidence back to your hypothesis so that your reader understood in what context you meant it. Do not introduce new evidence in your conclusion. Evidence is introduced into the body of your paper. The conclusion of your paper or the concluding sentences of your paragraphs shouldn't introduce new evidence. They should summarize what you've already proved. Use the George Washington Writing Center. You pay for it in your tuition. It's a valuable resource. I suggest you use it. Use spell check. I cannot tell you how many times I have received papers and presentations with lots of words with squiggly blue underlines under them. That's just sheer laziness to me. And it's going to cost you points on your paper as well. Those are easy. Realize that spell checker isn't perfect. Sometimes you're going to right click on those misspelled uh, words that Word or PowerPoint assumes are misspelled and you're going to find that you used it correctly and that they are wrong. But about 95% of the time you'll find that there's an error there that you need to correct. So take the time to use it. A final thought. A year after you finish this course, you will remember very little of the course content unless you happen to be working in this specific field or in a related field. And that's okay. What is more important to me is that as a graduate of this program, you are able to view new events with a critical eye. 
find sources of credible information to evaluate new events as they happen, and cut through the rhetoric and hyperbole common to this field and find the truth. If you can do that, then I have succeeded in my goal. This is a dynamic field. No one is an expert on everything in cybersecurity or cyber conflict, but being an expert on critical thinking, research, and analysis will enable you to succeed where others will not. With that, I again welcome you to the course and wish you good luck with the rest of the course.